Hello, everybody, and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Leah, and I usually post ASMR content, but today's video is a true crime. And if you hear any strange sounds, um, I have my pug on my lap <laughs> because in my pug's mind, wherever I am is the place to be. And he was not having it today. He did not want me to leave him um, in my boyfriend's office. So he's here with me right now. <laughs> so I've um, got my pug. I've got some tea, and I have a little bit of a new attitude towards these true crimes because I recently figured out that I'm just way too in my head trying to make them perfect and I'm not going to do that anymore. So, let's get into the video. Today's true crime is, it's a crime from the Victorian era, meaning that it happened um, in the 1800s. Was it 18, 1850s, I believe, around there? And the interesting thing about this crime was that it was a husband and a wife who ended up murdering an acquaintance of theirs, and they were tried together, and they were executed together for their crime. So, a little bit of a warning, obviously this is true crime, but you're the one that clicked on it, so <laughs> I'm assuming you already knew that. You ready, buddy? I wonder if you guys can see him. Oh. oh, no, he's comfy. I brought a pillow in for him to sleep on, so we'll just leave him there. <laughs> okay, so the names of the people involved were Frederick Manning and his future wife, Maria. So Frederick Manning, he was born in England around... 1819 and we obviously have the benefit of hindsight knowing that he was a murderer so I don't know if this is an important fact or not but it is interesting or I thought it was interesting that he may have had kind of a messed up sense of entitlement from a really young age because apparently his father made it really obvious that Frederick was his favorite child. And he would tell his kids that, you know, Frederick's my favorite, I don't really like you that much. And he even went so far as to leave um, the biggest sum of inheritance to Frederick. And he also said that upon his mother's death, Frederick alone would get another, like, small lump sum. So, I don't know. I just thought it was interesting in the case. So, yeah. I don't know if it really means anything, but, I mean, can you imagine your kid coming to you and being like, do you love me? And then the parent just saying, like, you're not my favorite, but you over there, you're my favorite. That would probably mess with your head a little bit, right? I don't know, in my opinion. But anyway, as Frederick grew up, he eventually started working for the Great Western Railway Company, and he worked as a guard. And from what I understand, this was actually a pretty serious job. Like, it was his responsibility to ensure the safety of all of the passengers, keep the train on its schedule, uh, guard the train, the title of his job, make sure that nobody was stealing anything or robbing anything, and that's what he did for many years, and this is actually how he met his future wife, Maria. So Maria, she was actually born in Switzerland, and her given name was Marie LaRue. And when her parents died in her early 20s, she moved to England and she changed her name from Marie to Maria. And apparently 
English people there believed it was easier to pronounce and it looked more professional or something. I don't really get that. Maybe you know if you're from the UK. But <laughs> she moved to England and she found work as a personal maid. Now she started working for a very prominent family and the family's name was the Pox. So Sir Lawrence Pock. I didn't know who that was either, but <laughs> maybe it's a well-known fact if you're from the UK, but I wasn't aware. He was a British politician, very wealthy, very prominent, and Maria began working as a personal maid to his wife. Now, working as a personal maid basically meant that Maria was to help her with anything and everything. So from doing her hair to helping her with her makeup, helping her to get dressed, um, and also just being like a social companion to be with her pretty much all day. And it was also her responsibility to travel with her wherever she went. And so this is how Maria and Frederick met when Maria was going on a train trip with her boss. Um, she met Frederick and they started dating. Now, fast forward a little bit, when Lady Pock passed away, Maria found work again with another very wealthy, well-known family. And this time she started working for the daughter of a duchess. And so again, she was expected to go everywhere with her. How you doing, buddy? He's asleep. <laughs> um, and I can't remember her name. The Duchess of Sutherland, I believe. And um, she had to do a continental trip via ship. So Maria went with her and this is where Maria met another gentleman whom she also began dating even though she was already with Frederick. So this is where we meet our victim and the next person in the story whose name was Patrick O'Connor. So Patrick O'Connor, he was from Ireland and he came to England around 1832, I believe. Yep, <laughs> I remembered. Now, when he moved to England, he... Um, I don't want to say too much, because obviously he was the victim of a horrible crime, but um, Patrick wasn't... He wasn't perfect. Like, he was a little bit crooked. And when he moved to England, he originally wanted to be a police officer, but he quickly changed his mind to thinking that the police were corrupt. And so he found work as a tide waiter, which I again had to Google, and it was basically just like a customs officer. So Patrick worked on the docks in London, as well as the ships that were coming in and going out. And just like a customs officer, he inspected all of the goods and um, just things that people were bringing in to make sure they weren't illegal. And as while working as a tide waiter, he realized that he was very good at smuggling illegal goods. Things like, or things like tobacco and alcohol where he could make a big profit off of them. So he started doing that and then he also started working as a loan shark and he charged like a substantial amount of interest. So he wasn't perfect, he was a little bit of a criminal, but um, you know, it didn't do anything too too bad by like the standards of the story. Anyways, Early in 1846, 
while Marie is working with the Duchess again. Um, she boards the ship where her and her employer are about to go on, I think, a year, almost a year-long um, tour. And Patrick happened to be on that same ship working. And apparently, after everyone had gone to bed, Patrick and Maria were the last two people awake in the ship's saloon. So I guess like the bar. And they started talking. And they fell absolutely head over heels with one another. They were just completely smitten. And Patrick thought that Maria was very, like, exotic. She had a very foreign accent that he had never really heard before. And he was apparently very attracted to her manners. <laughs> and then Maria, she was attracted to Patrick because he was kind of mysterious and he was 20 years older than her. So she found him to be just a gentleman and very, she was very interested in him. They started talking, and Patrick was so smitten that he actually proposed marriage to her that night before she got off the ship the next day. And she said no, but she invited him, I guess, to kind of start like a courtship. So she said, I work at the Stafford House, which was a very like just a very amazing or I guess very impressive place to work because it was where the Duchess's father lived. Apparently Queen Victoria was like a frequent visitor there and it was very impressive that Maria worked and she lived there in the staff quarters. And she said, why don't you come and visit me there when I return? <laughs> And Patrick said, absolutely. So, Maria goes on her continental tour, and then she returns later on in the year, and Patrick takes her up on her offer, and he starts visiting her frequently at the Stafford House. Okay. So, Patrick is visiting Maria frequently, and remember, Maria was dating Frederick at the same time, so she was kind of, you know, she was dating two men at the same time. <laughs> Make with that, you will. Make what that of you will. Make of that what you will. Good boy, Dex. Lost my train of thought. <laughs> All right. So while this was happening, Maria wasn't even really trying to hide the fact that she was dating both of them. Patrick and Frederick, they knew about one another, and they would even bump into each other, and both of them knew why they were there. They knew they were both dating Maria. And so, again, um, working at the Stafford house kind of started to go to Maria's head. She was constantly surrounded by the richest, um, just like enviable people and these people were living the most beautiful luxurious lifestyles and Maria eventually she was just kind of like I want that I don't want to be a maid anymore I want to have you know a more lavish lifestyle so she was waiting around for one of her two boyfriends to propose to her to make her a wife and eventually give her notice. So Patrick, he was her first choice because, remember, he was a loan shark who charged a lot of interest and she assumed that Patrick had more money and would therefore give her a better life, right? However, Patrick just wouldn't propose to her. He seemed to enjoy hanging out with her and, you know, doing the other things that they were doing with one another, but he wouldn't propose. Okay, buddy. Oh, he's asleep. 
You may be able to hear him snoring. <laughs> so, um, she continued waiting around for Patrick to propose, but she kind of held Frederick on the side. She just kept him around just in case, <laughs> which is really awful and sad, but anyways, she started writing letters to Patrick, really angry letters saying, you know, I don't understand why you won't propose to me. What good is it for us to continue this relationship if you're not going to marry me? And still, he refused to ask her. Here's my theory, which I don't have any evidence for, but I think it makes a lot of sense. I think that Patrick um, really was totally smitten with Maria the day that they met on the ship. And I think he was genuine that first night when he asked her mm -hmm. to marry him. However, when they started dating back in the city and he realized that she was dating two men at the same time, I think he was very turned off and probably pretty salty about that. And he kind of just continued dating her for fun, but decided that he wasn't going to take it any further. And I'll get back to that, but I, that's my theory. So <laughs> make of that what you will. And so Frederick decided to kind of strike while the iron was hot. And he realized that Maria really wanted to get married to somebody. So he made up a little bit of a lie. <laughs> He knew that she was very motivated by money, and so he said, well, my mother just passed away, and I have been left with a huge lump sum of inheritance from her. And he drew up a will and said that Maria would get all of that inheritance money if they got married upon his death. And hearing this, hearing that there was a lot of money to be made, Maria agreed to marry Frederick. So the two of them get married. And right after the marriage, Patrick writes Maria a really angry letter. And he completely scolds her for ever having slept with him while she was engaged to Frederick. So... You know what I mean? I Like, why would he bother doing that if she was never really someone that he intended to get serious with or she wasn't really someone that he really did love? I don't know. I think he loved her. And I think he was angry that she was dating another man at the same time. That's my theory. <laughs> so, Maria and Frederick were married for a little while. And this was where... Frederick got into some serious trouble at work on the railway. So in a 12-month period, upwards of 4,000 euros was stolen. So 4,000 euros worth of valuables and goods, they mysteriously went missing from the train cars that Frederick was responsible for guarding. And he was let go from his job because even though the police couldn't find any direct evidence um, on Frederick of the stolen items, he was, there, there was just too much evidence pointing towards him. And so he was fired. Goodbye, Frederick. And another thing was that at the time in England, and I guess kind of worldwide, um, train robberies were like a very serious thing. They obviously they still would be today, but it was um taken differently for some reason and basically Frederick and Maria were like cancelled in the community. Nobody really wanted anything to do with them knowing that Frederick had possibly robbed his own train. And so they didn't really have any choice but to leave and go back to Frederick's hometown of Taunton. Sleepy little beer. 
I wonder if Dexter's gonna sleep the whole time. He probably will. <laughs> okay. So Frederick and Maria, they go back to his hometown. And I'm using air quotes <laughs> to say that they used Frederick's inheritance slash savings or the money he stole from the train, it's debatable, to buy a charming little inn called the White Heart Inn. So this is what they're doing for work now. They, they're running an inn together as a couple, but um, their marriage is very on the rocks at this point. Not that it was ever that stable to begin with, but Maria is pretty angry at this point because she's realizing that Frederick obviously lied about the huge inheritance that he promised her from his mother's death. That never really came. And she's kind of fed up with their marriage at this point. So she begins um, rekindling her relationship with Patrick. And it's actually to the point that she leaves Taunton to go back to London for several days at a time to hang out with Patrick. And she doesn't even lie about where she's going. Frederick knows all about it. And Frederick doesn't really care at this point either because he's constantly having other ladies come to the house to keep his bed warm. So I think you know what I mean. <laughs> now, with their business, it was doing okay at that point, but it wasn't doing the best because they didn't really have a good relationship to run a business together. But something else would happen that would really make everything start to crumble. So on January 1st, 1849, the great train was running from Plymouth to London. And there was a huge, huge robbery that took place that day. Like thousands of euros worth of valuables and goods, again, were stolen from one of the train cars. And on January 1st, um, whoever had robbed it got away with it. And so, so the geniuses who robbed it, they decided to try robbing another train again the next day, thinking that they would get away with it again. However, authorities were ready for it and they caught them. Now, the people who robbed the train, their names were Robert Poole and Edward Nightingale. And can you guess where these two were staying? Like, which inn they were staying at? Can you guess, buddy? That's right. They were staying at the White Hart Inn. They had booked, like several nights stay at Maria and Frederick's little inn, which was pretty suspicious, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> when they arrested the train robbers, um, Edward Nightingale, he didn't give the police his real name. He used the alias of Frederick Manning, which was just super weird. And another red flag was that Robert Poole had... Um, a really good relationship with the Mannings. Like, he was really good friends with them. So they've arrested these two guys who just robbed a train, and they are staying with Frederick Manning, who was a guard on the train, who knew the ins and outs of how it worked, who had also been fired from the company for allegedly robbing the train, and they were really good friends. So that didn't look very good for the Mannings. They were arrested, brought in for questioning, but police couldn't really prove anything, so they let them go. But Maria and Frederick were, they were pretty much in hot water, again, for being associated with the people who had robbed the train. And so people really just, they stopped coming to the inn because they didn't want to be associated with the Mannings anymore. So the inn tanked. Business started doing really bad. 
they didn't have customers anymore and so they were forced to close it and they moved back to London. Now this is where they purchased a... they attempted to open a pub because they were just such smart business people and such a good couple. They thought they could open a new business, but that didn't work either. And they moved to Minver Place in... is it... Bermondsey? I can't believe I didn't look that up, how to properly pronounce it. But anyways, um, it's why it's called the Bermondsey Horror. This is where it took place. Now, neither Maria nor Frederick were working at the time, and so in order to bring money in, they started taking lodgers into their house. And again, the marriage was doing really poorly. Maria was constantly spending time with Frederick. No, <laughs> she was constantly spending time with Patrick. And Frederick was cheating on her as well. And Frederick was also drinking a lot. Like, to the point that he was making their lodgers very uncomfortable. So just very unprofessional. An example of how uncomfortable Frederick was making their lodgers let me tell you, <laughs> they had a young lodger staying with them named William Macy, or Macy, and he was a young medical student who was lodging with them for, I think it was four months while he was attending school. And Frederick, in pretty drunken state, he stopped William one day and he started asking him some pretty weird questions. So he was like, William, what kind of a drug would intoxicate a person enough that they wouldn't pass out, but I could get them to sign a really important document? Hmm, William, what exactly does chloroform do to a human? Hmm, could I chloroform somebody and get them to sign a piece of paper without them knowing it? Huh. What part of the skull is the most dangerous to hit? Hmm. What part of the skull would 100% be fatal if you injured it? Hmm. So, those were the kind of questions he was asking his lodger, which made his lodger extremely uncomfortable, obviously, but he just assumed that Frederick was drunk and didn't really know what he was asking, so he didn't really think much more of it at the time. Now, after a couple of days after asking those questions, Maria and Frederick urged William to leave the house. They gave some weird reason, like they had to leave town for a few days, so they needed him to leave and none of it really made any sense, but by that point, they were making him so uncomfortable that he just agreed to leave. Okay, so I don't really have a good, like, um, transition into this next part, <laughs> so I'm just gonna say it, but it was Maria's idea to kill Patrick. That's it. She gave the reason to the police that the reason she wanted to kill Patrick was because he had agreed to move into the house at Bermondsey Place with her and her husband. He said, I'll move in there with you and I'll help pay the rent. And then when he decided to go against that, she got angry enough to want to kill him. And Frederick's motive for killing Patrick and agreeing to go along with it was obviously because he hated the guy. He was, he'd been his rival for all of those years, and yeah, he couldn't stand the guy. But the little piece of information that Maria had left out to the police um, was the fact that after her and Patrick had rekindled their relationship in London, Patrick had grown very fond of her again. 
I think especially knowing that her and Frederick's relationship was so rocky at that point that he wanted to start a life with her. And by this point in time, Patrick's loan shark business was doing so well that he had, you know, saved up a substantial amount of money. And he told Maria that he didn't really have anyone else to leave it to. And so he had said, I've drawn up a will, and in case anything happens to me, I'm going to leave this substantial amount of money and property to you, my dear Maria. It's always, it's always the money in these cases. And, um, yeah. Maria said, I want to invite Patrick over for dinner, and we're going to kill him. And so this is what they did. They sent a letter to the docks where Patrick was working and basically inviting him over and um, Maria wrote the promise of, you know, being alone together. <laughs> Make with that if you will. The first invitation, he didn't show up. The second invitation, he came to dinner but he brought a friend so that wasn't going to work. And then by the third invitation, he showed up. And this was important because the third letter that he got at the docks, he actually read it aloud to his friends before he left for dinner. And it was interesting too because apparently his friends really didn't like Maria. They thought she was... A bad seed and they actually urged Patrick to end the relationship with her and he would promise them you know nothing bad's gonna happen sorry Patrick something bad's about to happen but anyways on Thursday night Patrick leaves work he goes to Maria and Frederick's house for dinner now witnesses saw him walking to the house. The neighbor to Maria said that she saw him that night outside with a cigar and just talking to Maria and that was the last time he was ever seen alive was through her testimony. So Friday morning comes, Patrick does not show up for work which was super unlike him. The weekend rolls by Monday morning comes and Patrick is still a no-show at the docks. Eric's getting a snack. Oh. What's he getting? I think he's getting Fruit Loops. <laughs> Maybe I can lift this up. You're so precious. Oh my goodness. You see him? Can you see him? <laughs> So his cousin and his friends are really worried. This is super unlike Patrick. So they go to his house and they start talking. Um, they say, okay, the last time we saw him was on Thursday and we know he was going to Maria's house for dinner. And they go and they knock on, you okay? Making pug noises? Little pug noises? They go and they knock on Patrick's land, <laughs> landlady's door, landlady's door, and they say, have you seen Patrick? Like, when's the last time you saw him? He's slapping his tongue around. <laughs> and, um, unfortunately she is, well, in the end she was a big help, but at the time she said, no, I haven't seen him. Um, I did see, like, his girlfriend, Maria, she was here on Thursday night, as well as on Friday night, and she went into his apartment, and she said, I didn't think there was anything weird about that, 
I didn't see Patrick with her, but I had just assumed she was letting herself in because she's here, you know, all the time. She didn't see anything weird with it. And so Patrick's cousin says, okay, something's not right. This feels really weird. And so he goes to the police and he says, I think we have like a missing person on our case. I don't know where my cousin is. And the last place that he was seen was at Maria Manning's house. So the police say, okay, we'll go, let's go to Maria's house and see if the Mannings know where he is. And they go and they talk to Maria in her kitchen. They sit down and they say, we've heard that the person that we're looking for, you were the last person to, you know, see him, hang out with him on Thursday night. And Maria played it like so cool, so casual. And she didn't even really give off the hint that she was like worried about him like the guy that she'd been seeing for all these years and she just said oh you know um yeah i invited him for dinner he never showed up blah 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 and then william says well you were spotted at his house on thursday and friday night and she says yeah i went there to go check on him because he didn't show up for dinner i didn't find him there i went and checked and then i went home and um with that, the police couldn't really do anything else, so they left. So, Patrick's cousin, William, he was not satisfied with this, and you can call it, like, family or friend intuition. He, he was like, no, something's not right here. So the next day, he finds another police officer and he asks him to come with him back to Patrick's apartment. They let themselves in, and they take a look around to see if they can find either Patrick or find a clue or something. What William ends up finding is a box, like a, um, like a security or safety box that he knows his cousin keeps a lot of money, and valuable things in and they pry it open and I don't I want to say to their surprise but probably not uh, they see that everything in it has been stolen like everything worth money is gone and the last person that was known to be in the apartment of course was Maria so this this is reason enough for the police officer to say Okay, that's a little suspicious, so let's go back to Maria's house and talk to her again, see what's going on. So they go back to Maria's house, and surprise, surprise, Maria and Frederick are gone. And the house is like, literally empty. All of their furniture is gone too. So when I say empty, I actually mean empty. And there was like... A funny man there who the police were like what are you what are you doing here <laughs> and he said oh well Frederick and Maria they said I could have all of their furniture like I, I purchased all of their furniture from them and I just finished moving it all out back to my house so that's a little weird so all of their personal belongings are gone they've sold all of their furniture now something is really suspicious. And so they start taking a closer look around the house. Now, one of the police officers is walking in the back kitchen. So they had like a front kitchen and then one that was further in the back that I guess was kind of used less often. A police officer is looking around that kitchen and he says something looks a little bit off with the flagstones on the floor. So this kitchen, like the flooring was made of, um, you know, those beautiful big like 
oval or different shaped stones that you usually see like on patios. That's what their flooring was made of in that kitchen. And he says a few of those stones look weird. Something doesn't look right. So he takes out his pocket knife and he starts kind of like digging around in the mortar, which is like the basically like cement. Not exactly, but it's like cement that keeps the stones down. And he said the mortar is wet and it smells sour, which means it's fresh. And it shouldn't have been like that because the flooring was not new. And another police officer says, okay, um, I'm not going to feel right until we dig those up and see see what's going on because we're looking for a missing person, right? So they get a shovel and they lift the flagstones up out of the floor. They notice that there's like way too much mortar has been used. It's just been done really poorly in a rush. It wasn't done professionally. And he says, okay, let's start digging into the dirt. And about 12 inches down, they find a rag, like a linen rag. And one of the police officers says, "Mm, that rag smells like a dead body. So they keep digging and about 18 inches down, they find the body of Patrick O'Connor. Now, his legs had been like tied to his torso to make him fit into this hole in the kitchen floor and he was covered with a two inch thick layer of quicklime. Now, I thought I had an idea of what quicklime was, but I had to look it up too to make sure I got it right. (laughs) So quicklime could be, I don't know if it is today still, but it could be used as like a building material. But a common way to use quicklime, especially back then, was to dispose of bodies. And specifically, what it would do was basically cover the smell. Like if you're burying a body in your kitchen floor, you probably wouldn't want that smell going on. Now, when they removed Patrick's body from the floor, the post-mortem exam found that he had upwards of 18 very severe wounds to his head that had clearly been delivered by a really blunt object. And they knew this because his skull was not cut into, it was shattered. And he also had a bullet in the right side of his head that had lodged, it was lodged in. And they pretty quickly determined that they assumed that Patrick had been like intoxicated or in a lying down position when the injuries had occurred because they were all on like the right side of his head. So the coroner said, I think he was either like facing down with his head up or he was laying down, or he was in some sort of an intoxicated state where he wasn't able to fight back. And they also concluded that the bullet had probably come from um, an insufficient power source, if I got that quote right, and they believed that it was from a poorly loaded air gun. So another interesting question that Frederick had asked William Macy, the medical student, was, quote, how fatal would an air gun shot be to the head at close range? End quote. So make of that what you will. So that's not suspicious. But it was very clear to police that this murder had been premeditated. Like, there wasn't a doubt in anybody's mind. So one... Two weeks prior to the murder, Frederick had gone to a local builder, like down the street, and asked if he could order um, a bag or whatever it would come in 
of quicklime. And when the builder asked what he wanted it for, he said, um, to kill slugs. He had also gone to a local shop where he had bought an 11 pound crowbar. And when the shop owner asked him what the crowbar was for, he said, quote, to lift heavy things up, such as flagstones, end quote. Mm-hmm. And then I think three weeks prior to the murder, Maria had purchased a shovel, which she said was for, quote, digging, end quote. And if those three facts weren't bad enough, um, the investigators said it was very clear that the hole in the ground had been dug, like, weeks prior to the body being put in it. So it was premeditated, like, without a doubt. So now, there was a full-blown manhunt on for both Maria and Frederick. So, like, what the heck happened after the murder? Well, we already know that Maria, on Thursday night, after they killed Patrick, she immediately went to Patrick's house. She let herself in because she had a key, and you probably already guessed it, she broke into his little locked box, and she stole all of the valuable things that she could, specifically share certificates, which is important because I'll come back to that. And the reason that the landlady had seen her there on Friday night as well was because she had simply gone back to the apartment one more time to make sure she hadn't missed anything of value. So, days after the murder, Maria told Frederick, I'm pretty worried that the police came to talk to us, and I'm a little suspicious that they are on to us. So she tells her husband, can you go out and find somebody to buy all of our furniture? Let's sell everything and get a bunch of cash so that we can, like, go on the run. And Frederick says, great idea, honey. He leaves the house and he goes to find that buyer down the street to purchase all of their furniture. What he doesn't know is that while he's out, Maria quickly packs all of her bags, all of her valuable possessions, and she gets in a cab and goes to the train station. And I know it said cab in all of the documents I wrote, but I think what it means is like a horse-drawn carriage. So don't picture like a yellow taxi cab. <laughs> so yeah, Maria believed that she was now a free, very rich woman, and she didn't want to have a husband dragging her down. So she abandoned Frederick to be alone in the house where they had just buried a body. So again, she gets in her cab and she goes to a train station where she leaves her big um, luggage containers or luggage boxes and she leaves those there in the luggage storage and she leaves it under the name of Mrs. Smith, so an alias. And then she goes to another train station where she catches a train to Scotland. Now, like, we already knew Maria was a bit of a dum-dum, but she made this so easy for police to catch her, and it actually makes me kind of smile. <laughs> Hold on, though, my throat hurts. And I'm, I'm gonna say this wrong. Please correct me in the comments. Edinburgh? <laughs> Is it Edinburgh? Edinburgh? I should know this. You know what I mean. The capital of Scotland. That's where she fled. And she goes to stay in a lodging house. And she asks the owner, can you please direct me to, um, not a bank, but like a shareholder, a shareholder's office. And she gets the directions. She goes to the shareholders and she presents to them 
the railway shares that she stole from Patrick's apartment. Now, what she didn't know was that Scotland had received a telegraph um, basically stating that you need to be very careful in dealing with anybody who presents you with railway shares from London because a bunch of them were stolen. So Maria didn't know that Patrick had stolen those and yeah, she was just really dumb. So she presents these stolen railway shares to the shareholders. A couple of days go by and they realize, holy crap, this woman brought in stolen shares, not yet knowing that she's also wanted for murder. So they go to the police in Scotland and they say, we think we've been dealing with a woman who stole some railway shares. And the police at this point have realized that she was probably hiding in Scotland. And they say, hmm, by any chance does she, does her physical description look like this? And they describe Maria and the men go, yeah, that, that was her. So they say, do you, uh, do you know where she's staying? Did she leave any information with you? And Maria had left the address of the lodging house. So just like that, they go to the lodging house and they arrest Maria for murder. And I think they slapped, um, they slapped like, I don't know, whatever charge it would be to try to sell stolen railway shares. She probably got that too. <laughs> okay, so what about Frederick, right? Frederick basically disappeared overnight and nobody had any idea where he had gone, but police assumed that he may have fled to the British Islands. They assumed that because it was somewhere that he had been before, but they weren't sure and they couldn't find him. Luckily, a woman came forward and said, I'm pretty sure I saw Frederick Manning, the guy wanted for murder. I'm pretty sure I saw him get off a ship that I was on and he docked at Jersey, which... Again, I should have looked it up. I don't know if it's like a city or a town or if it's an actual island itself, but it's in or a part of the British Islands. And she said that's where I saw him get off. So police had a really good place to kind of start looking. Now, Frederick was, um, he stayed there for quite a few days and word hadn't got over to the British Islands yet of this murder because, you know, information didn't travel fast then. <laughs> so nobody knew who he was and he had a few days to just kind of stay in hiding. And um, he didn't do a very good job of hunkering down and staying quiet because he ran into a friend like a really good old friend of his who happened to be on his honeymoon and he was like, oh my god, hey, Frederick, what are you doing here? All the small talk and he said, we should definitely get together for dinner one night I'd love to catch up with you Frederick says, yeah, that sounds great but obviously Frederick um, got pretty freaked out and he did not go to dinner Instead, he checked out of the lodge that he had been staying in and he moved to a different lodge. Now, the little inn or lodge, whatever you'd like to call it, the new one that he moved to was kind of in the middle of nowhere, like off the beaten path. And it was run by like a sweet little old lady and her husband who just took lodgers in for extra money. And he checked in there, and he stayed there for a couple of weeks. Now, I didn't know what to make of how he got caught. I didn't... You can't make this stuff up, but this is what happened. Frederick was not doing good 
I think he was probably in shock from the fact that he had just committed murder and he was drinking about a bottle of brandy a day, which was, it's a lot. And this is how he got caught. So on this little island, the only, I guess, maker slash supplier of brandy was one specific guy. He, <laughs> can you hear Dexter? was one specific person and he, all of the brandy that anyone on the island had including the inns and the hotels came from him and all of a sudden in the past couple of weeks he's receiving like extraordinary amounts for brandy requests which he thought was really weird because the sweet little old couple who ran the lodge they didn't drink and they very rarely bought alcohol for their guests. So he says, huh, that's a little strange. <laughs> and by this point in time, word had gotten to Jersey saying that a murderer, um, there's a possibility that a murderer is like hiding among us. So keep your eyes peeled. We're looking for a Mr. Frederick George Manning uh, wanted for murder. And so Mr. Brandy Man, he thinks, oh my god, could this actually be the guy that's wanted for murder? So he decides to do a little recon, half brandy maker, half spy, and he goes to the property of the lodge and he starts spying. And what he sees is Frederick come outside every night and he won't leave the property but he'll just sit in the back garden and drink and he'll like cover his head cover his face with his top hat to make sure no one can really see who he is and the brandy maker thought that was really suspicious so he goes to the police station and luckily for him a police officer from London had just came in on a ship trying to look for Frederick on the island and the brandy man I'm sorry I keep calling him the brandy man I'm just too lazy to look at my notes to see what his name was but he says like uh, here's my evidence I think that Frederick Manning is staying in this little inn and I think this because this guy's really suspicious. He never leaves the lodge. All he does is sit around and drink. He's covering his face and all of that. I think it's him. You need to go check it out. And the police officer agreed and he got a little team together and they go out to the lodge. Now they get there around 9 30 at night. It's pitch black and they all light a little candle <laughs> And they storm inside the lodge. They break, supposedly, Frederick's door down. They shine the candles down on his face. And the police officer says, that's, that's him. That's Frederick. Arrest him. And they all jump on him, tackle him. And when Frederick regains his composure, his entire um, attitude changes. And he's like, oh... Oh my goodness, I'm so glad you're here. I was just about to head back to London in the morning to sit and have a little chat with all of you. Have you found my wife yet? She's the guilty one. It was all her idea. She killed Patrick. Blah, 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 blah. So Frederick just completely claimed his innocence, said he had nothing to do with the murder. It was all Maria, and he even was like in shock that the police officers were putting handcuffs on him <laughs> so they take him to a ship put him in the jail of the ship whatever that's called and they take him back to um they take him to horsemonger lane jail where his wife is also being held frederick's like confession and i did air quotes again because i don't know <laughs> He said that, again, it was all Maria's idea. He had nothing to do with it. 
He said my wife was very angry that her lover promised to move in with us and then he didn't. He took back that promise. So Maria was so angry with him over that that she invited him over for dinner and she said, Patrick, you need to go into the back kitchen to wash your hands. And when Patrick went back to wash his hands, he leaned over. The right side of his head was up a little bit. And while he was washing, um, Frederick said Maria came up behind him, placed one hand on his neck, and fired a fired an air gun at his head. And when Frederick came in because of the loud noise, oh my goodness, he saw Patrick laying on the floor, deceased. And he was so shocked and so upset by this that he passed out. He couldn't believe what his wife had just done. And when he woke up, the body was gone. And he had no idea what Maria had done with it. So that was Frederick's story. And when the police asked him, so you didn't see the big body-sized hole being dug in your kitchen floor? And he said, oh, I saw it, but um, I assumed that it was for me. I thought my wife was going to kill me, so I didn't want to say anything to upset her. Huh? So both Maria and Frederick were held in Horsemonger Lane Jail. And on October 25th, 1849, the trial for the murder of Patrick O'Connor began. Now, Fred was charged with basically discharging a loaded pistol at Patrick's head, causing severe injury. And then he was also charged with delivering the blunt blows to Patrick's head, which were what actually caused his death. Maria was charged with having been present for the actual act for aiding and abetting. And I believe, I believe at this point in time, a wife was like literally required to do whatever it was her husband asked her to. But the interesting thing about this was that the judge ruled that even though they couldn't specifically prove if it had been Frederick or Maria who had actually killed Patrick, it didn't matter. They were both charged and I guess they had to give a, they had to put a name to the actual physical act for who had done it, but it didn't matter. Like they were both being charged and they were charged together as a couple and they were both given the death penalty. So the story ends on November 13th on the roof of the Horsemonger Lane Jail. At nine o'clock, open the door to the roof and they escort Frederick and Maria to um, the hanging platform. It's said that Frederick walked pretty confidently whereas Maria was very feeble and it seemed like she was pretty out of it and she didn't really know what was going on so maybe she was in shock. It said that Frederick and Maria paid absolutely no attention to one another as they were walking to their final breath, if that's what you want to say. Um, I believe there is, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is a rumor because I read a few times that it said that they kissed right before the sentence was done but in the actual report i couldn't find anything like that so i'm pretty sure that's just a a rumor but yeah they um they were hanged 
for the terrible crime that they committed. And it said that because Maria wore a black silk veil, that she was responsible for killing the fashion of black silk or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know what you want to make of that, but um, yeah. I think justice was absolutely served in this case. These were two terrible, terrible people. And I think they got what they deserved. <laughs> Come here, buddy. Oh, it's so sleepy. So yeah, thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this case really interesting. And we hope you have a really good night. <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> Thanks for watching, guys. Um, yeah, if you enjoyed the video, please think about giving it a thumbs up and maybe even subscribing. It helps me out like crazy. So <laughs> thank you so much. And I hope to see you again soon. Bye.